Awesome. Thank you so much. I am so excited to be here. And uh, yeah, thank you to Lee and Erica for helping uh, to organize this and getting this all set up. I know we were chatting before we got on here that it's been a, a long time in the works. And so I'm excited that it's finally happening. Um, and also, I'm super jealous of everybody who's from a warm destination. I saw like Honolulu and California here. <laughs> I'm based just outside of Toronto and Niagara on the Lake. So I'm very, very jealous of everybody who has the warm weather right now. I'm going to share my screen. Um, and is that working? Can everyone see that? Yeah, okay, perfect. Awesome. So um, as Leah said, today I'm gonna to be talking a little bit about how to use uh, your platform, your online platforms, whether that's your blog or uh, your email list or social media to help support sustainable tourism um, and how you can leverage your online content uh, to, to better this cause and to help people travel uh, in a better, more meaningful way. So, perfect. Um, so this is just a uh, outline mostly to keep myself on track because I have a horrible habit of going on uh, tangents <laughs> and getting horribly off track. So uh, we're going to talk really briefly about what sustainable tourism is, um, some of the, uh, I hate the word opportunities that COVID has presented, but opportunities that COVID has presented for us to act on sustainable tourism. Um, and then I'm going to give you guys 10 strategies that I use to support sustainable tourism online and then also provide some additional resources uh, that you guys I think will be able to access um, when I give you guys the slides after the presentation. And then uh, I think this was like in the presentation abstract, but whether you have like a million or a hundred followers, I just want to emphasize that like you have a voice. If you have an online platform, that's one of the greatest things about the internet and about social media is that um, everybody has the ability to um, make a difference and get information out there regardless of how many followers you have. Also, I apologize if I'm like looking sideways. I have two monitors going here. And so I'm just looking over there a little bit. Um, so as Leah said, I'm a travel and food writer and I'm based in Niagara-on-the-Lake, Ontario. Uh, so which is the heart of Ontario wine country. I just actually moved out here. My partner's a winemaker. And so I'm like learning to uh, appreciate and experience Ontario a little bit more with the pandemic and loving the staycation life that we, we get to live here when we're not in lockdown. And I mainly focus on, uh, my writing focuses on sustainable tourism, travel to coastal and island regions, wine and food culture. And then the other hat that I wear aside from like my travel blog and my social media or influencer <laughs> presence is that I'm a graduate student at the University of Guelph and my research is focusing on seafood sustainability and seafood value chains. So if you do follow me on social media, you'll notice that a lot of my content right now, um, while we're not traveling, is focused on seafood and helping to educate people about sustainable seafood and how they can make more sustainable seafood choices. So seafood and travel is kind of how I group the work that I do. So what is sustainable tourism? This is a very um, long-winded official definition from the World Tourism Organization, um, but it essentially you know, means that uh, tourism is sustainable both ecologically, um, economically, and, and socially for the communities that we're visiting. And I just like to put this graphic up that is like, uh, horrible quality, um, but to emphasize that sustainable tourism encompasses all of these different types of tourism, you know, like um, ecotourism, ethical tourism, these are all, you know, different types of tourism and kind of words that have, um, frankly, I think been thrown around the industry a lot um, in recent years that everyone is not really sure what exactly they mean or what exactly the difference is. And so I just like to show this graphic to say that when I am speaking about sustainable tourism, I am talking about all of these things. Now, my preferred definition of sustainable tourism is this one, is that if tourism doesn't work for locals, it doesn't work. Um, and this is by Doug Lansky, which um, he is a fantastic uh, speaker and thought leader in the sustainable tourism space. And so if you haven't heard of him and you're interested in sustainable tourism, I highly recommend looking at his stuff. Um, but this is my preferred definition. And I really think that, you know, whether we are just traveling for the sake of traveling and seeing the world or we're traveling for work or we're creating content and writing about it, the local people um, need to be a priority. Um, and, you know, I think now more than ever, we're aware, aware of that this pause and travel has definitely given us an opportunity to assess why this is so important. Um, but I just think that it's really important that especially going into the rest of this presentation, this presentation that we keep in mind that 
centering locals and the wants and the needs and the priorities of local communities needs to be the number one priority, whether we are travelers or content creators. Now, all of this to say, while there is never um, a bad time to promote sustainable tourism, it's always a good time to be a sustainable traveler and to talk about sustainable travel on social media. Um, like I said, I hate the word opportunity, but we really do have an opportunity here with COVID, um, with this pause to, you know, take a moment to reassess um, what has been not so great in the travel industry. And I, I think a lot of the, those conversations have been happening over the last year. Um, and a lot of recognition has gone into, you know, that weren't being done so great and how we can improve those. Um, and there's a real opportunity presented right now in this pause uh, for content creators and anybody with a social media account um, to have a say and to use their platform to change the future of the travel industry um, in the long term. And so I just have like a few, this one stat here that says, you know, several surveys and projections have indicated that this year is going to be uh, the rebound for travel, likely closer to the end of the year, but nonetheless, um, you know, everyone's been home for so long and people are eager to travel. Um, and so let's use our platforms to make sure that we are traveling right um, and ethically and responsibly um, and help to shape uh, a really just better future of travel. And so like I said, I want to share 10 um, take home strategies that are hopefully easy to digest and you can start implementing right away from this presentation. Um, and I like to use the phrase educate, advocate and motivate, uh, which is what I think about when I post my content is that I want to post content that is educating people about, you know, whether it's seafood or sustainable travel, it's advocating for those causes and ultimately motivating people uh, to act and to take action on those topics. So um, the first strategy that I want to share um, is asking permission. Um, so like I just said, locals are the heart of sustainable travel. So their wants and needs need to be prioritized, especially when we're using them as the focus of an online story or social media post. Um, so whether you are taking somebody's photo um, or using an anecdote or a quote from a conversation that you've had with somebody, it's also it's always super important to ask permission. Um, the photo one, I think, comes maybe a little bit easier to people, um, but even, you know, if I'm writing a story and I want to highlight a conversation that I've had with a local person or use their voice to help me in a blog post, I always want to make sure that I have their permission to use their voice and their quote um, and their statements and that it's being represented in a way that they feel is accurate and that they're comfortable with. So the second recommendation or a suggestion that I have um, is to not geotag specific locations. And I know geotagging is an important part of content creation. And so I'm not saying to not geotag at all, um, but make them a little bit more generalized. So I'm using an example here um, when I traveled to the island of Molokai in Hawaii, which is a um, very small, not touristy island at all. And, you know, then the, the local people on Molokai have done a really remarkable job of not allowing um, this particular Hawaiian island to be taken over by tourism the way that some of the other ones have and they like to keep it that way and so they really want visitors to the island to respect that um, and to not go around you know sharing exactly where certain things are where certain beaches are and making those things publicly known um, and so as you can see on some of these photos I've just tagged Molokai or I've just tagged Hawaii even more generally um, and not responding to people who are, are commenting or messaging me, asking me specifically where these destinations are. Um, just keeping the, the tag a little bit more general can help um, you know, not encourage massive amounts of traffic to some destinations or some specific sites that might not have the capacity to deal with all of that tourist traffic. Now, um, don't promote illegal activities. I am shocked that I even have to say this and I doubt that anybody who is um, on this call does this anyway, um, but this is a screenshot from somebody's blog post. Um, I, I apologize that a lot of my examples are from Hawaii, but that's just a region that I'm very familiar with. And um, this is a very like common post that people have made over the years about how to access illegal sites on the islands and I really think that, you know, a lot of this has been motivated, especially, you know, by the, the travel like content industry and people are always trying to, you know, be the first one to find this like untouched or like off the beaten path site um, and trying to, you know, not be a like basic tourist or traveler and trying to find cool new things. Um, this is not the way to do that. This is, you know, these, these 
sites are illegal um, or are barred from tours entering them for a reason. Um, for this you know, particular one, um, it's actually very dangerous. And what happens is that a lot of tourists end up accessing this part of the island illegally. They end up hurting themselves or getting stuck there. And then that takes away from um, health and medical and emergency response resources when you know helicopters need to be flown out to come rescue tours who shouldn't have even been there in the first place. Um, so don't do this. Um, you can definitely find cool uh, spots to take photos or cool destinations or cool you know little spaces or destinations to visit or places to visit um, at a certain destination without making it um, illegal. <laughs> And then the fourth tip is to fact check. Uh, this is the age of misinformation. And so it's really important that, you know, people with the platform don't contribute to it, whether it's purposefully or accidentally. And so it's always really important that you um, confirm that your information is accurate, fact check it, you know, find your sources. Um, I always like to recommend like having sources on hand. Um, I've especially recognize the importance of this over the last couple of years, like when I am you know, citing statistics, especially with like seafood and things or topics that are a little bit more contested or where there seems to be a little bit more of a gray area. I always recommend having sources on hand. Um, you don't necessarily need to like cite them in your blog post, but just to have them on hand that if somebody comments on it, asking for a little bit of more information, you are ready to provide it. Um, it just, I think like helps to build trust with your audience and helps you even just feel more comfortable um, in what you're posting about. If you do decide to post citations in your blog post, that's also a great idea. I've done that in the past before, just like putting them at the bottom and stuff or hyperlinking them in the text so that people can, um, you know, just verify that information for themselves. And it also, I think, especially um, for people who are maybe like newer bloggers or maybe new to the specific topic or don't consider themselves to be an expert in the topic, which you definitely don't need to be an expert in sustainable tourism to talk about it. Um, it helps to build your credibility if you can back up what you're saying with, uh, with sources and citations. And so in a similar vein, um, educate yourself and stay up to date on the information, you know, go the extra mile. If you're going to be sharing this information on social media, um, make the extra effort to, to find these resources and reports and documents and keep yourself informed about what's going on. Um, it's also a good idea to vet the airlines, tour operators, and hotels that you are traveling with. I know that in a perfect world, you know, somebody would already do that for us, or airlines and hotels and tour operators would be transparent about their sustainability criteria. Um, and I think that is becoming, you know, more of, um, more of the norm or expectation now, especially with this pause and, you know, this um, reckoning that COVID has kind of uh, given to the travel industry. I think that we will start to see a lot more of this, but for the time being, um, it's not really the norm for that information to be entirely transparent or accessible. And so I just encourage you that if you are going to be talking about this, you know, go the extra mile, um, stay up to date on this information, um, and then share your findings with people, you know, don't, don't keep it to yourself. That's the whole point of today is to share what you know, um, and make that information even more accessible. So the sixth tip is to get to the why. Um, I think that this is one of the most important tips that I'm gonna tell you today, um, is to get to the heart of why sustainable tourism is important. And by this, I don't mean to tell people facts or numbers or statistics about climate change. I mean, get to the human why. Um, it can be your own story or somebody else's again, that you have consent to share, but get to the heart of the why by telling a story that people can empathize with um, or can relate to. That's, you know, over the years in my academic research specifically um, and working on you know different climate change related issues i've noticed that you know people are not inspired to act based on numbers or statistics but they're inspired to act when they hear a story you know about a family that resembles their own or they you know hear a story that can help them contextualize how you know climate change might eventually affect you know the well-being or the livelihoods of their children um, those things resonate with people and so with sustainable tourism you know i always encourage people to you know tell stories of local communities tell stories of how you know their travel experiences might be different um, and just try to really lean into that that human element um, in my own like 
research again, like focusing on seafood, um, I found that I really started to gain traction in the work that I was doing when I started to explain why that work was so important to me. Um, and, you know, I would say, you know, my family's from the Azores Islands, you know, seafood is such a big part of our, um, our culture and our, 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 our family values and our socioeconomic livelihoods. And when I explained it in that way, um, it didn't, you know, it was, people were able to, to recognize that, oh, I have cultural traditions too. And, you know, I need to make money in X, Y, and Z ways to support my family. And I can see now that like fishing and seafood is important to your family for those reasons, because, you know, there are things in my life that are also important to my family for those reasons. Um, and so just trying to find that common thread really um, just makes people connect a little bit better. It builds trust. Um, people feel closer to you and they're much more likely to, to act when they are inspired in that way. Um, so the next step is to make your point quickly. Um, I know that when it comes especially to sustainability and sustainable tourism, these conversations do need to be a lot more nuanced. Um, I totally understand that. But in the age of social media, you only have a few seconds to grab somebody's attention. Uh, so I recently made a TikTok. I, I fought this for a very, very long time. Um, but I recently got on TikTok. And what I've learned is that you really have um, only a few seconds to grab people's attention. I mean, most most TikToks are about 15 to 30 seconds. Um, you know, I've read uh, reports and, and stats that say people aren't actually even watching them beyond 15 seconds. So you realistically have 15 seconds of their attention. Um, and if you don't hook them within the first one second of your video, they're scrolling past it. And so, um, like I said, I know these are nuanced topics. They're big topics that require a little bit more time to explain, but if you can hook people in just a few seconds and you can learn how to take these like larger topics um, and put them into bite size, uh, bite sized pieces of, of content, like on a TikTok or like an Instagram reel, or in a short caption, um, you know, people will come back and they'll click more and, you know, they'll, they'll consume that information maybe at a slow pace, but at least, you know, they're consuming it a little bit more um, a little bit at a time as opposed to not at all. And um, there's a really good quote that says, if you can't explain it to a six-year-old, you don't know it well enough yourself. And I keep that in mind, you know, especially with my research or when I'm posting captions um, to really keep it simple. Like I said, I know these require a lot of like nuanced conversations and big detail. And maybe you do that in a blog post where people who do want to have that longer conversation can go. Um, but recognizing, you know, places like TikTok and, and Twitter, like they really want those short, quick snippets of information that can be consumed by six year olds and are easy to understand. And then tip number eight is to set an example. Um, so make sure that you're practicing what you preach. Um, be the best sustainable traveler that you can be and share that personal journey with your followers. Again, this builds trust. Um, you know, your followers will see that you're actually abiding by the same like things that you're telling them to do. Um, they feel like they have a connection with you. And then again, like that, that human connection and you know that empathetic story, people are more likely to actually want to take your advice and follow your footsteps because they feel like they have a connection with you. And that if you're doing this and okay, I'm gonna do this because you know then I'll be more like this person or I'll have a, a bigger connection with this person. Um, you know, if they see you doing it, they're more likely to do it as opposed to if you're just telling people to do things and not actually taking your own advice. Um, that's not a great way to build trust online. And then kind of in a similar vein, don't be afraid to, you know, ruin the aesthetic or ruin your Insta Instagram grid. Uh, sustainability isn't always sexy, um, but don't be afraid to document those less than perfect moments. This also speaks a lot to building trust with your followers and building, um, you know, building an authentic experience online, which I think, you know, now more than ever, people are really craving, um, which is also why I think, you know, we've seen, you um, a real interest and in uptick in platforms like TikTok, where the expectation is not to have like a beautifully shot, like cinematic YouTube video or like perfectly curated Instagram posts. Like people want to see more of that, like raw, not 4K footage, you know, not touched up skin. Um, people want to see, you know, your own struggles with sustainability. And so don't feel like you have some sort of like perfect expectation to live up to. I think with sustainability and sustainable travel, especially, you know, people uh, want to know that it's okay to make mistakes. And, you know, we'll feel, um, we'll feel that way that feel that it's okay if they see you making mistakes and, you know, you telling stories of learning from your mistakes um, and, you know, being, uh, being open and not afraid to share those not so perfect moments. 
And then the last tip that I have is to join forces. Um, find, find a group of like-minded people exactly like are on this event. Um, you know, joining events like this is a great way to find people who are also passionate about similar topics. And at the end of the day, a group of voices is far more stronger than just a single voice. Um, and so, you know, I recommend joining networks um, like this network, attending events like this event, you know, connecting with people in the chat, um, you know, talking, uh, talking offline, you know, coordinating like messenger groups and whatnot, figuring out how you can, you know, even plan like social media campaigns together or collaborate on a blog post um, or do, you know, do things in a team that will have a stronger impact than if you were doing them alone. Um, another tip to also find people is to util utilize hashtags. My boyfriend makes fun of me because I do this like every single night when we're sitting watching TV. It's like really easy and mindless to do. Um, but you know, I'll go look up like the sustainable tourism hashtag on Instagram or the sustainable seafood hashtag on Instagram. And I'll go see what other people are posting and I'll go to their page. And I'll be like, oh, you know, I've found so many like other seafood bloggers and sustainable travel bloggers that way. Um, just by looking through the hashtags on Instagram, um, you know, you see all these posts, you go to their page, you follow them, you connect, you have a conversation, um, and then you found somebody that you may not have otherwise been able to connect with. And so just a quick summary. Um, again, like I like to say, the educate, advocate, and motivate. Um, so again, like staying up to date on information and sharing that information, encouraging knowledge mobilization, uh, making information more accessible online, making it easy to understand by getting it across quickly and simply and then making sure that you have consent and are representing stories in a truthful and accurate manner, fact checking and, and using sources and your information, um, and then motivating your followers by, uh, by finding that human connection and that thread um, and being empathetic with them um, and just finding ways to connect with them on a more human level. And I just like to have this quote in here again, like I said at the beginning, you don't need a million followers to make a difference on social media. Um, you can do it with a handful. I'm pretty sure when I started my blog uh, five or so years ago, my mom was the only one reading it at first. <laughs> and so you can, you know, you can make a difference. These things take time. Um, but even if you're only talking to 10 people, that's still 10 people that you're talking to and you're having an influence on the way that they think um, and the way that they act. And then, so like I mentioned, I do just have a couple of slides here with additional resources. If you um, wanted to access any like other readings, um, these are all hyperlinked. And so I think we'll make sure that we can get the slides to everybody so you guys can access these. And then I just want to talk about one final resource that um, that is my own resource that I have available, um, and it's an ebook that I've been working on now for the past uh, almost year, <laughs> um, and it's called the Conscious Influencer, and it's basically um, a larger version of this presentation, um, and a more generalizable version of this presentation that can be applied to um, basically like any. Um, I hate the word cause, but any like cause or issue that you're passionate about, whether it's sustainable tourism or seafood or gender issues or food systems um, or energy transitions or climate change or what have you. Um, this is basically a guidebook that I've created based on my five years of working in the influencer digital marketing space and then seven years working um, in academia um, on science communication projects. It's basically just a resource that helps you identify communication strategies and opportunities to leverage social media, blogs, email lists, and online platforms to, um, to educate, advocate, and motivate people to take action on things that you're passionate about. And so as a, as a thank you to everybody who came today and hung out with me, um, I wanted to offer a discount uh, for you guys. And so the, uh, the book is currently on pre-order, so it'll be available on March 1st. Um, and if you pre-order the book and you get on the pre-order list, it'll be available to you for $3.99 on March 1st. Um, but for members who want to pay today um, and then get the book on March 1st, you can pay $24.99 today um, and get it on March 1st when it is available and then after March 1st the price goes up to $49.99 um, and so I just wanted to give you guys the opportunity to access more information if you are passionate about using your platform again whether it's sustainable tourism or some other issue that you're passionate about um, the guidebook has chapters on you know for all the way for beginners to finding your niche and figuring out which platform is best for you all the way through to things like monetization and how to work with brands that share similar values um, and essentially be able to generate an income off of just sharing information that you're passionate about, which is um, a pretty sweet gig in my opinion.
And so uh, the links are here. So if you do just want to buy it today, um, my website is seasidewithemily.com and then you just go slash shop and you'll see the Conscious Influencer Bundle there. So it is an ebook and a workbook bundle. And so there is a um, companion workbook that basically takes you through all the information in the ebook, um, different prompts and exercises for you to work through to help you um, establish yourself as a conscious influencer. And again, identifying you know what uh, cause you're passionate about, which platform you want to be on, which brands you want to work with, how to grow your audience, how to build trust and rapport with your audience. Um, and uh, the workbook basically has those prompts alongside the ebook. Um, or if you would like to do the pay later and just put your name on the pre-order list so you can lock in the $34.99 price, uh, you can do that at seasidewithemily.com slash pre-order, except there's a typo and there's only one L in my name. <laughs> Um, and that's all that I have for today. Um, so those are my social media handles. If you guys want to follow me and uh, join me and connect with me, I would love to connect with you guys on social media and chat a little bit more about this. Um, but yeah, I wanted to keep it short and, and sweet to leave a little bit of time for, uh, for any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, I think everyone this presentation was an excellent kind of like snippet of the valuable information you can get in your book. So if it's anything like the presentation, it's going to be fantastic. And I appreciate you going in depth of like what literally is in the book, like worksheets, etc. cetera. Um, so guys, uh, hit up seasidewithemily.com and then you can also pre-order it and get that generous discount. So appreciate you for um, handing that out to this community. So we're going to go with a few questions. If you guys have any questions, if you think of them as we're chatting, uh, go ahead and drop them in the chat. <laughs> and everyone is saying what a wonderful presentation it was. I am a huge fan of listicles. So like, thank you for being like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. If you guys love numbered lists, go ahead and drop a me in the chat because I'm obsessed because it keeps me on track. It's like, here's one point, two points, three points. <laughs> so I want to take it back to the beginning a little bit. I know there was a few people that maybe dropped, dropped in in the middle of the conversation. So can you tell us why you decided to focus more on like sustainable seafood versus, you know, being a vegetarian or buying organic or like eating free range meat, that type of stuff? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's actually... Um, it's actually based on me having a horrible grudge or a great ability to grudge. Um, I was, uh, my undergraduate studies was in like environmental policy. And at the time I volunteered with a marine conservation organization. Um, and I mean, long story short, there was like a conversation where they basically said, you can't uh, be passionate about the ocean or want to save the oceans if you also eat seafood. There's no way to eat seafood sustainably. It's just not possible. Um, and then again, like my family is from the Azotish Islands. Seafood is like at every family function. It's such a huge part of our cultural identity. Um, I have family members who are still fishermen on the islands and I recognize like what a massive uh, contributor it is to the economy. And I thought like, I know these people, they're not, you know, destroying the oceans. They're very conscious and um, like fishermen are, in my opinion, the greatest stewards of the ocean. And so I just just didn't believe what they were saying and so basically I made the rest of my life's journey like <laughs> set on proving them wrong and proving that you can eat seafood sustainably um, and that's exactly what I'm doing with my research and then again like just trying to make that information uh, more digestible online and sharing tips and information online to share uh, seafood is like frankly the same as sustainable tourism there's so much information out there like it's so hard to disentangle different eco labels and different like what facts from alternative facts and what's true and what's fiction. And so I really just try to uh, do that on social media and show people that, you know, seafood's great. You should eat it. It's so good for you. Um, and that you can do it, you know, without destroying the environment. You can feel good about that. 100%. And I think in meeting you, that's something that I've gone through just the past couple of days. I've been pescatarian for eight years and I'm like, well, how, how do I take this to the next level without becoming like a vegan or vegetarian? Like I love the ocean. Yes, but I do love seafood and I refuse to give up salmon. So Emily has a lot of great resources. If you're in between, like I am, or if you've been like kind of stuck at being like, okay, how can I do better for the world while still enjoying what I like, which is seafood. Right. So, all right. We got some great questions coming through. So LF has one about, uh, when you travel, how do you pick the locations that are less known and therefore have little online presence? 
Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, I learned what I do now when I travel is I usually don't make plans the first or the second day that I'm there, depending on how long I'm going to be in a destination. And I usually spend at least the first day just talking to locals and finding out, you know, where, uh, where are the local spots? Where should I go? Um, Because you're completely right. Like these hole in the wall places they don't have online presence and they don't have social media and what i actually learned is like um that's on purpose <laughs> um like they don't they don't have the capacity to like handle huge tourist influx i know like i um went with a tour operator one time and they said you know people always tell us like to get a website to make booking easier because i remember when i booked with them like i had to like call somebody and it took like three weeks just to like book this reservation and miss calls and trying to get somebody on the phone and they're like no we do that because like um, we, we want to maintain the number of tourists who are coming here and we want to be conscious of that. Um, and if we just put a website online, everybody will be here and we can't handle that and our, our environment can't handle that. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, like if you have, I know it's kind of, if you only have a limited period of time to travel, it's kind of tough, but I recommend like, you know, taking that first day, wandering around whatever destination you're in and, and talking to people. And that's how I found like the best, like food spots, like bars, things to do, like local people will tell you like the hole in the wall places that you would never find on your own. So just talking to people if you can. Absolutely. And even wandering around and peeking in restaurants and being like, okay, there's a lot of locals here. This must be good. And just Mm -hmm. plopping down and ordering off the menu, the limited menu sometimes. So (laughs) awesome. Thank you for that wonderful tip. I completely agree with wandering around and asking locals for the first day. So Erica wants to know, besides yourself, what is, um, who are some of the Instagram accounts that you love when it comes to conscious influencing? Mm, That's a great question. Um, So Justin plus Lauren, who I think they did like a nomadic mat uh, talk a little while ago, they post great stuff um, and they're vegan. So they also have a lot of cool food content. Um, And then Joanna from Rooted Storytelling, I love her content. She, uh, Rooted Storytelling has her her website and she posts um, a lot of great stuff, especially for content creators. I think I have one of her resources in here that are just so, um, so informative and really in depth, a, a little bit more long form. Um, and then Kelly from Impact Travel Alliance is really great. Kelly's awesome and like lives for sustainable travel. Uh, so those are like my top three that come to mind. Awesome. Thank you for that. Er- uh, Erica is dropping the links in the chat, everyone, if you want to check them out at a later time. So thanks for those recommendations, <laughs> Emily. Also, if you didn't know, if you want to save the chat down, everyone in a Zoom meeting, if you're on desktop, there's three little dots at the bottom right-hand corner, hit those dots and hit save chat and it will save it to like a Zoom folder on your computer. It only works for desktop at the moment. Hopefully they'll be rolling out mobile function for that Zoom or soon Zoom. Wow, okay. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> um, Ketty wants to know, uh, you actually might have a blog post about this, but which certifications or memberships do you look for from companies, both for seafood and for tourism? Things that are focused on, you know, ocean, water, seafood focused tourism. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I actually, and now that you bring this up, I realize I totally have a resource for uh, sustainable travel certifications that I'm going to make sure I link in these slides before I flip them back to you. Um, Because I do have a list of some like really reputable like green destinations and Uh, I can picture their logos, but I can't think of their name right now in the sustainable travel space that are really great to look for um, on like things like tour operators, hotels, airlines and whatnot. Um, And so I'll definitely make sure that that is linked um, in the version of the slides that I'll flip back to you guys. It's basically just like a list of some of the top ones that I um, go to. And then for seafood, I actually don't have a blog post about this yet. It has literally been in my drafts for like three years, <laughs> but I do have a, uh, a sustainable seafood guide, which is like a, it's a free PDF download. Um, and in there, I disentangle some of my like top five um, seafood eco So things like Marine Stewardship Council is kind of like the biggest one. Um, same with Aquaculture Stewardship Council and then recommendation guides like OceanWise and uh, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood watch. Um, I talk about some of the, like the pros and cons of those. Um, and spoiler alert, I think eco labels are great and seafood specifically. The reason that I don't think they are like the end all be all is because um, as a 
currently seafood eco labels only are based on like fish stock numbers and ecological sustainability and they don't account for things like um, social or economic issues so if fishermen are working in um, safe and comfortable conditions or if they're being um, paid a fair wage and so that's um, what I like to just say up front about eco labels, they're definitely an easy way to tell ecological sustainability, but that social piece is not not quite up to par yet. But um, yeah, I can put the link to download that in here as well that if people are interested in learning more about sustainable seafood. Yes, please drop that in the chat. And thank you for bringing that up. That is so important. It's like, yes, this this product, this piece, this, this food, um, you know, maybe green or eco-friendly, whatever it is, but it's like, how were the working conditions that, that people made it or they farmed it or however they grew it? Uh, what are they like? Are they being paid fairly, et cetera? So that's also another level to take it when you're wondering, you know, is this, is this ethical, right? Um, okay. So Logan has a question of what are your top sustainable travel destinations? Mm, I love this question. I think that every destination can be a sustainable travel destination. I know that might be a good answer, um, but I think that every destination, you know, has the ability to, to be a little bit better and that there's no like number one. Um, if I did say number one, I would say that island of Molokai in Hawaii. Um, and what I would say is that that one of the most like transformative travel experiences of my entire life like I mentioned they're a small island they are not geared towards tourists at all there's like one hotel there um and the local people they're like there's a I think a very um harsh misperception of people on Molokai that they hate tourists or they don't want people to come visit and um, that's not the case at all they totally welcome visitors but they welcome visitors who are coming to learn about culture on Molokai and are coming to experience what the island has to offer saying on Molokai, um, don't come to change Molokai, let Molokai change you. And they are totally receptive to people who are coming to the island under like, under the impression or the expectation that it is like the polar opposite of Waikiki. Um, like I said, the local people have done a really good job there of like making sure that they have, you know, control over their island um, and things are, you know, definitely sustainably managed because of that. Um, and then the other one that I would say, and this is totally me being biased, um, is the Azores Islands in Portugal. They are, um, I think they've actually been ranked like a few years in a row, one of the top go tourism destinations in the world. Um, and there are nine different islands there. So, so much stuff to do and see, so much good seafood um, and also a lot of like nature activities, a lot of hiking. Um, there's a really good hike you can do on Mount Pico that I did two years ago um, where you can actually like hike to the top of a volcano, which is the tallest um, mountain in Portugal. And so those two would be my like top sustainable tourism destinations. Thank you for that advice um, in Mol Molokai in Hawaii and then Portugal. I think you'll fit right in here because Portugal has been a hot topic in common thread through quite a few of our chats. So I think you just gave everyone else another reason to go to Portugal or any islands off the coast. Of. <laughs> so, all right. So um, Emma wants to know, how do you recommend we educate ourselves more on what constitutes sustainable travel? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I Some of the resources that I have linked in here, I think are a great place to start. Um, and then some of those other influencers that I mentioned, like reading their blog posts or the content, um, there are like a lot of academic articles, which like are kind of not easy reading, I'm not going to lie, um, but super informative about sustainable tourism. Um, but I think like you know, people say like you are like what you eat. I think we are the content that we consume. And so I like regularly go through my social media channels and make sure that I, you know, am like creating a feed that is representative of things like sustainable tourism and sustainable seafood. And so I think like following those influencers is a really great place to start. Um, and, you know, reading their blog posts and their social media posts. Um, and then just be conscious of, you know, if you are reading news articles and things like what the sources are, um, if you feel like it's a reputable source. I find that, you know, a lot of um, good reputable sources, is like I'm in Canada, so the Globe and Mail and not those things are behind a paywall. Um, and I usually find like even the New York Times as well, like those seem to be really great um, sources of information that are like trustworthy and fact checked. Um, I read a lot of those articles as well. All right. Great. Thank you for that. Good tips. Uh, Milena has two great questions. 
Uh, going back mm. to how you said you don't reveal locations when people DM to ask you, how do you reply? Yeah, that's a great question. It like I've definitely had a few people um, who like maybe just think I'm being like mean or like selfish and wanting to like, like safeguard the destination. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I just tell them, um, you know, I'm not really comfortable sharing the exact location. You know, like if you want to visit, like you can talk to locals and they'll, you know, they'll if they want to show you, they will. Um, but I just try to, you know, say, I'm not comfortable telling you exactly what it is and I'm not trying to be rude, um, but you know, it's a sustainable trailer and I just don't want to send a huge influx of tourists to someplace. Frankly, there are some people that no matter what you say, like you're going to piss them off and they're not going to be happy with it. Um, and that's just kind of something that you'll have to accept and I don't know, deal with when people start to get, you know, mean or aggressive. I just, you know, block them and don't even bother responding. At that point, it's you know, very clear that they're not even somebody that you ever should be giving that, you know, destination information to in the first place. Um, and the people mm -hmm. who, you know, who should be going to that destination and who would appreciate it um, and visit with the similar values that you have won't even ask you those questions. Um, and so I just, you know, I just say I'm not comfortable hearing. Um, and like I said, that might not please everybody, but <laughs> I don't know what will. Right. I mean, could you even preface something like say it was a post? Could you preface it as like, oh, ask any local when you get here, they'll know where this destination is, something like that. But mm -hmm. yeah, I, and actually like, um, unfortunately, like I traveled to Molokai like right, like weeks before COVID happened. And so I actually haven't published a lot of the content just because like it hasn't really felt, you know, appropriate at the time. Like it's kind of like, uh, I don't think I should be publishing travel content right now. I think now I'll, I'll probably start publishing it more. But the one piece or the two pieces that I did publish about Molokai, like I very clearly like put almost like a disclaimer at the top saying like, this is not your typical like Hawaii vacation. This is so different. You know, I've been to, to Maui and Oahu and the big island. And I'm like, this is like another world. This is so different. There's a certain expectation of travelers here that if you are not going to uphold this, if you are expecting to be drinking Mai Tais on the beach and have like deliver them to you at, you know, noon, um, that's not going to happen here. And so, you know, if that's the way you travel, there's nothing wrong with that, but maybe this isn't the destination for you. And I, uh, I made that very clear in all those posts with that, like, preface that you know there is an expectation and if you're not going to meet it don't bother <laughs> that's perfect and I think you know hopefully people will understand once they read that and they know what they're getting themselves themselves into by reading and by visiting so I think that's great and mm -hmm. very appreciative that you do that because I know a lot of people wouldn't <laughs> So Matthew ha wants to know, how do you promote sustainable tourism and get buy-in from the local communities with regards to balancing jobs, tourism revenue, and preserving environment? So that can be a huge challenge in uh, Matthew's personal experiences, for example, Bali, Boracay in the Philippines, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's a, a great, tough question. Um, and you're right, it is like a a challenge. And I think it goes back to, you know, the first point that I um, had in this presentation about asking consent and making sure that you're um, representing destinations in the way that they want to be represented. Um, and so, so, you know, if I am going to write a story about a hotel or a tour operator, um, you know, it, it's impossible in, in the nature of like the work that um, I do or other bloggers, you know, write a story and, you know, send it to everybody that you talk about for feedback and make it, um, you know, completely perfect. That's not really like um, standard journalistic standards, but just making sure that like you, you let them know like, hey, I'm going to write this story and this is what I'm going to say. And if they say, wait a second, that's not actually like accurate about, you know, our, our socioeconomic situation or, you know, the way that we view tourists, like I said, in Molokai, there's that like misrepresentation there like um i think talking to locals is the best way that i found to make sure that i am representing a story um, in an accurate way um and then like you said it, it is challenging also because there are going to be a lot of like conflicting um opinions like nobody not you know if you put a group of people in a room not everybody's going to agree that's just human nature um and so i just try to you know do my due diligence and make sure that i'm you know doing the best that I can to tell the most accurate story, speaking to the most people, 
um, the most local people and just you know trying really hard to make sure that their voices are not being lost um, in the content that I'm producing. Um, and I know it's a difficult balance and I don't know if that quite answered your question, but you're, you're right, it, it really is a, a huge challenge. And um, I will say um, also um, like working with tourism boards and hotels, mo more so I guess with hotels. Um, when I do work with hotels, one of the first questions that I always ask is about the number of local people who are employed at the hotel um, and not only employed, but in um, management positions because if a hotel wants to work with me and they approach me in X, Y, and Z, and they tell me that, oh yeah, we employ like however many X amount of local people. And then I ask, oh, how many of those people are in management positions? And they say none, then that really doesn't mean anything if you're employing 90% of the population at entry level minimum wage jobs, um, that's not a sustainable operation. And so I um, always try to challenge the people, the brands that I work with also. Um, and I will be completely transparent in saying that that has backfired on me sometimes. And some brands are not um, interested in that. And they just want to, you know, they want somebody who is going to go and take the pictures and write the content and not ask those difficult questions. And um, I think that because of COVID, things are like that's not going to fly anymore um like yep. there's been like uh the the what's the saying like the <laughs> it's been uncovered like there's there's nothing to hide behind anymore mm -hmm. um and so i i i am hopeful that i won't get that kind of pushback from brands anymore but i will say like if you are working with brands um things like that to not be afraid to challenge them and like i said it, it might like bite you in the ass sometimes but in the long run um it's worth it and especially if this is something that you're really passionate about like creating content um you don't ever like want to sell yourself out and so i think like staying true to your values will always like pay off in the long term so sorry that was a long-winded answer and i'm not no, sure if i entirely answered your question <laughs> wonderful no it was more than we could even ask for that's so great <laughs> and i agree with you i think honestly with covid and what last year showed us is um a lot of transparency and safety and how these brands can adhere to that because people are going to be wanting to know, you know, safety kind of took on a whole new meaning last year. In addition to like travel safety, it's like, okay, what else can we do to keep the public health safe? Right. So I think that um, transparency applies in, in every aspect. So I appreciate that, that long response that covered even more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, all right. Uh, Erica, said she asked this seems like a very niche topic but as an influencer what are some avenues you're able to make money with your blog especially during covid um i yeah i agree this is super niche um and what i would say is that like i've been blogging for over five years now and i didn't generate much income i saw like the greatest like income and revenue generated when I niche down, like when I really got into the nitty gritty, like at the end of the day, everybody can start a travel blog. That's not a niche anymore. Even sustainable travel, frankly, like at the end of the day, all travel should be sustainable, right? Um, and so I think that the more you're able to niche down, um, the better return you'll see. Um, like Erica and Lee and I, we were chatting a little bit um, when we first got on that I actually just recently rebranded. And so my website used to be called um, Airplanes and Avocados and sustainable tourism was the sort of niche. And then I realized, you know, I'm really passionate about seafood and all of the destinations that I visit are, are islands or coastal. You know, I, I love seafood and, and food tourism and I'm a big scuba diver. And so like, there's something very specific about the way that I travel. Yes, it's all sustainable, but you know, that's a given, you know, the seafood that I eat is sustainable. The food that I consume is sustainable and the way that I travel is sustainable. Like, I didn't really feel it was a niche anymore. And so I completely rebranded to Seaside with Emily um, and have now a narrow, narrower focus on like I, I, you know, work in coastal and island destinations and maybe that limits a little bit about of the travel brands that will want to work with me. Um, and then again, you know, I focus on seafood. And so maybe that like um, limits it, the amount of like food brands that want to work with me. But since doing this, um, like I'm not even a year into this rebrand now. And I have seen like just the amount of success from like when I rebranded to what I was doing um, before the, the five year mark is just, um, it's crazy. And especially now with COVID, um, because I do also focus on like the seafood and the food and the wine aspect, that's given me something else um, to write about and create content about when we when we can't travel. And so um, that's why like if you go to my social media channels now, it's uh, it's mostly all seafood related um, just because we haven't been able to travel. And before Ontario was in lockdown, I was doing a lot about like food and wine tourism in Ontario. Um, 
but I, yeah, I just want to say like, if it sounds weird and too niche like it's probably perfect. Um, like I say, like really start like super, super niche down and like get into it and then you can expand, you know, like once you have a following, um, people will want to like read whatever content you put out because they're following you for you at that point. Um, and they'll want to know more about your life and, you know, then they'll be more receptive to like lifestyle content. Um, but I found like that was definitely the mistake that I made early on was like writing about very like broad topics all over the place like writing about like health and fitness and like books and travel and so many things that people were like what the heck is is going on here and so I know like you guys definitely have a ton of ideas I mean I also have a ton of ideas everybody has a ton of ideas but um niching down is like like the key and like I totally like didn't believe it or like was scared to do it I guess for the first four years or four and a half years of my Mm -hmm. blogging career and since doing it like it's just been like I, I still can't believe it sometimes how like crazy um, the like the returns have been. So, yep, the engagement. So I'm mm-hmm. going to be a little controversial here for a while because I've been in <laughs> or for a second because I've been in in many a, a webinar and a masterclass that says if you are still getting started, start broadly in your topic. So travel, write mm-hmm. about travel, and then niche down because if you hold yourself back thinking of a niche for like three years, you're never going to get started. What are your thoughts on that? I know you said you didn't really niche down or change or rebrand until like four years after. So mm-hmm. what are your thoughts on on that, you know, for people who need that extra push to even just start writing, start creating, start putting things out there? Yeah, and that's a good point. I definitely don't think you should uh, wait to figure out your niche. And if that means that you start writing and you have something that's more general at first like I totally stand by that um I have seen uh his name is escaping me right now but he's uh he's on Twitter and he tweets this great uh snippets of information but he always advocates for failing in public um and I have basically done that for the last like five years of my life you know like I said my blog used to be called something else I was writing about all kinds of things um and so if it's if you don't know your niche, like, um, yeah, start writing, write about everything and see like what you like writing about and what you're passionate about and what hits with your audience. Like that was something else too. Like when I really realized that I needed to rebrand and change directions was I was working with some of the largest, like, um, travel companies in the world, but I was writing posts about like the top 10 things to do in X city. Um, and I like, I hated it. Like, I was like, this is not fulfilling for me. This is not enjoyable. Like I, I don't want to write general like travel tips. And for a lot of people that is like, that's what they want to do. They want to share like just travel tips or they want to talk about their favorite like restaurants in a destination or, or do, you know, those kinds of things. But for me, like, I just felt like this isn't really what I'm passionate about. And I was really like struggling with it. Um, and what that's when I kind of like confronted, like, do I want to do this for the rest of my life? Um, or do I want to like find something that I'm a little bit more passionate about which is how I like steered more towards the coastal um and seafood stuff but yeah I say like if you don't know like fail in public like try everything until something something sticks I'm like a huge advocate of this I have never been somebody who is like scared to like try something um and I know a lot of people who are and I don't know maybe I've made a fool of myself a lot of times because of it (laughs) um but I can say it definitely pays off so yeah if you don't know like go for it write about everything and, and figure out what you like and what sticks as you go along. Yep. No, that's super helpful information and really inspiring as well. Cause I know there's probably some people in here who are still getting started myself included. I'm very broad right now. My TikTok has like dogs on it. Like, (laughs) um, and then Adam, you know, Adam in the chat was like, creativity is how we can find our niche. Great advice. Mm -hmm. And you know, Erica fail in public, like you said, start writing on a few topics, see what you, which one pours out of you the easiest. And I love that you recognize you're like, I don't really want to write about the top 10 things to do in, you know, Tokyo or whatnot, because there's others out there doing it. So something that speaks uh, true to your heart. So thank you for that. Um, All right. So uh, just a few more questions. If you guys want to hang tight and hang out with Emily, just for a few more questions. Uh, What is your absolute favorite sustainable travel tip, like off the top of your head or something that you do every time you travel? Um, oh, that's tough. I think like the, the taking the first day to talk to locals, like is one of my like favorite things to do. Um, in terms of like, I don't know if people would say it's a sustainable travel tip. I think it is because you often find, um, 
like local restaurants, local tour operators. And then you, um, when you go to those places, you're keeping money in their local economy. And so I see it as being a sustainable travel tip in that way um, that, you know, you're, you're keeping the money there and that in itself is a sustainable way to travel. But I also think that, um, you know, challenging uh, hotels and brands and stuff uh, is a great tip. And it doesn't even need to be brands. Like I said, you know, I've done that in the past with brand partnerships, but it can even be like, just as a traveler booking, um, a trip at a hotel, I call the hotel and ask them that. Um, and the ones who are doing it correctly um, and who are being sustainable and ethical and responsible will not be confused by that question and will be like excited and ready to say like, oh, actually like this is a percentage of local people in management or like our hotel is run by local people. Like you're like, oh shit, like that's amazing. <laughs> Whereas if you call somebody else and they're like, uh, let me find somebody who can answer that and transfer you around 20 times. Like that's probably a bad sign. Um, and I, I don't know, maybe I just get a kick out of people's butt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I've noticed like I stay, I stay in budget, big budget travelers stay in a lot of hostels. A lot of hostels are proud to show what they do. They're like, this is, we only imply locals. Mm -hmm. We, you know, everything's made of bam, recycled bamboo, like th that type of things. We reuse all of our water, et cetera. Like they'll post signs around saying like, this is what we do. This is how you know you're being taken care of and we're taking care of the land, the community, et cetera. So um, you're so right about people trying to hide behind it. And if they're truly you know, sustainable, then they'll, they'll shout it from the rooftops or tell you what you need to know or want to know. Exactly. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll be proud so, of it. Yes, <laughs> I have two more questions. Um, this one's for me, <laughs> asking for myself. So when a local tells you something, because I've experienced this a lot, like in the Philippines and Central America, when a local tells you something that's about like the community, the sustainability, whatnot, do you go and like fact check that as well? And then go write about it, or post about it? Or do you just like take their word for it because they're a local, they live there, they run the hostel, etc.? Yeah, that's a great question. I... And it, that's also something that I struggle with as well, because I never want to like, uh, like distrust or be like, um, I don't know mm -hmm. if I like believe that hundred, like, I, I don't ever want to come across like that. Um, and so oftentimes, like I might start with like asking other local people and seeing if that's a consensus among everybody. Um, and then usually if it is like, I really will like take it at that point as like, this is what it is. Also, a lot of the things that I find local people tell me like can't be googled <laughs> or like that information doesn't exist online um but if i do hear things that i'm like um that sounds a little bit like you know obscure or not entirely accurate um you know i'll google it um and i'll you know do my best to do my due diligence um and if i'm really like not comfortable or confident like i might even ask them um without again trying to come across like that but at the end of the day if i feel like somebody has told me something that i like really am not confident in i can't find it online um and i I don't feel comfortable like confirming or being like, oh, can you prove this? <laughs> Which again, like local people are the heart of sustainable travel. So we don't want to, you know, like belittle them like that either. Then I might just choose to like leave that out of this, of any story that I publish at the end of the day. Um, and so I think like there's a certain extent of due diligence that has to be done. And then there's a certain point where like, let it go kind of thing. <laughs> yep. Yep. And that's super helpful. Thank you for that. Cause I struggle with that too. I'm like, okay, well, if six locals are saying it must be true, but then I'm Sometimes I'll hear weird facts and be like, what? Like, where did you get this information? I get it. You live here, but this sounds kind of wild, you know? So exactly. thank you for your insight on, on that one. And I think we have, <laughs> we have one last question from Erica. This is a fun one. What is the video that's done best for you on TikTok? Oh my God. Do you know what? This makes me so mad um, because it's a video of my brother. It's not even of me. <laughs> Um, it's my brother and I like I'm so mad about it because I work so hard making all these TikToks and I like the one that has the most views um is my brother eating did you like eating. duet him or something like what no I, I should I should like so I, I, I'm like so flabbergasted I'm like this is I spent all this time on TikTok and the one that has the most views um is my brother eating a sardine head in Portugal with all these fun sardine facts and also like the music is Justin Bieber yummy and so I feel like I'm gonna attribute it to that and not uh, my brother <laughs> mm -hmm. but it makes me so mad wait I love the fact that you had fun sardine facts in it though because yeah. I I thought it would just be like a silly video of your brother with no context I'm like but there was your information in it yeah which is great so I know I try to be uh strategic especially 
um admittedly like I'm like I said I'm so new to TikTok I made TikTok like last month I like avoided it for so long and frankly I still find it so hard like if anybody has TikTok tips please like send them my way because I don't know how people do this with like the transitions like and people are like oh it only takes like two minutes to post a TikTok I'm like it took me 25 minutes no. to post a 15 yeah. second video <laughs> I've spent so two hard. hours on making like one TikTok before yeah oh my gosh so I don't even hard. get paid for this <laughs> <laughs> exactly but yeah I try to be strategic with posting like weird like videos but like the text content is informative or like it's like videos of my brother eating a sardine but then the you know text is all about like mm-hmm. facts about sardines or why you should eat them more um or just like crazy things of like me in my kitchen and like the, all the text is about like how to save money on seafood kind of thing um and maybe that's a little clickbaity, but I don't know if anybody has any other TikTok tips. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think I, I think I dropped in the chat earlier, the titles, you, you know, you screenshotted some of your TikToks, the title page helps because then it informs the viewers what you're going to talk about. So if you overlay the title page of five facts about, sar- about sardines, but it's over a video of your brother eating sardines, like, you know, that's yeah. still all you, that information is still all you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For sure. Funny. So now we can just head to your TikTok and watch, uh, find out all we need to know about sardines and sustainable yeah. seafood. <laughs> that is where awesome. all the seafood is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, Emily, that was so incredibly informative. And I felt like we touched on a few different topics here, which I hope everyone here can take something away from it. And we appreciated having you on. Yeah, thank you for having me. I super appreciate it. This was so much fun. And thank you for all the like amazing questions. I have totally found like doing things like Zoom and Instagram live can be really awkward sometimes. And I just feel like I'm talking to like a screen. And so I always appreciate it when people like are engaged and ask questions. And um, if I like didn't get to your question or you guys have more questions, feel free. Like I think my email was on the slides or my social media. Um, like I'm always happy to answer um, more questions offline as well. Awesome. Thank you for that offer. Yeah. Uh, we, Erica just dropped it right on time, dropped all of Emily's info in the chat, but it's super easy because she's seaside with Emily pretty much across every platform. Super easy to find her. And if you're on TikTok, go follow, go give her a follow also since it's the newest, <laughs> newest platform. So a oh, wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. So before we head out, I'm just going to share a couple things, some closing notes. Share the screen. All right. So like we mentioned earlier, if you found some value in the community, ooh, it wants me to start again. If you found some value in the community, um, in in this talk, in any presentation you've been to, any of the content that you've seen from TNN and Nomadic Matt online, we invite you to become a Patreon member and it is the exclusive this exclusive community you know led by Nomadic Matt and and our team you'll get the replays uh personal stories all these perks that you see in bullets here live Q and A's are my favorite because Matt comes on and literally answers every single question you have about anything travel or life related <laughs> and there are different membership levels as you'll see so. You can go to patreon.com forward slash nomadic mat to check that out if you'd like more information. And you'll see we have the um, slate of events for the next couple of weeks here. The nomadicnetwork.com forward slash events is where you'll go to find events for pretty much the next three, four months. We have happy hours, like I said, big speaker events like with Emily and myself answering your questions. Um, And then book club, our next book club is on uh, March 3rd, I believe. So just hit, hit up the website and you can see what's, what's coming up next. We have a happy hour tonight, Washington, DC road tripping next week, California happy hour and Canada's happy hour next week. And, um, a bunch of awesome events. Matt will be speaking in a few weeks as well on travel hacking. So once again, if it was just me, Emily and Erica, it'd be fun, but it wouldn't be the same, especially with all your incredible questions and your wonderful inquisitive minds. So you guys are what make this community. We love to see your faces and we'd love to have you back. And next time, see if you can like bring a friend with you for the next cool topic. And thank you everyone. We will see you again soon. Thank you, Emily. (laughs) All right.